And thank you and welcome everyone to the last uh, session today about COVID. Um, it's been very exciting to see all the presentations earlier and, and I hope many of you have caught those. Um, and, but I know there's been parallel sessions and there's actually so much of interest that has been presented, especially from countries. So I hope you will have a chance to catch those um, because they're all been recorded. They're all be available uh, on YouTube and uh, uh, the links are in the SCED and on the website. Also, I'd like to remind everyone that uh, we have a, a Q&A um, set up in our community of practice uh, forum. And uh, I just posted the link to that in the chat. Uh, should also, the link should also be in your sched, um, schedule. So without, without further ado, I'd really like to um, introduce the um, presenters in this session. We're very fortunate to have our key uh, global collaborators uh, and uh, partners with us, uh, Karin Gashin from Gavi, who will uh, talk about, uh, of course, uh, the impact of COVID, but I think also the much longer um, uh, collaboration that we've already uh, enjoyed for a number of years uh, with, uh, with Gavi for immunization. And, and also some perspectives beyond COVID. Then we'll have Michelle Monroe from the Global Fund. Uh, obviously, again, the COVID response is very central, but uh, we should not forget that uh, all the impact of COVID on the health systems in general, uh, a bit like the Ebola crisis, has also affected all other uh, vital health programs. So I'm sure Michelle will go into that. And uh, finally, Carl Kincaid from CDC, will um, uh, present uh, not only about the work we've been doing with CDC over the years, but an exciting recent development, uh, uh, which uh, allows, will allow us to work very closely with CDC in the coming years. So uh, with all that, uh, let me hand over to Karin Gashin from Gavi. Please. Thank you, Knut. Hello to everyone. Uh, let me share my screen. Voilà. So I think you should be able to see. So um, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to come and speak uh, during that uh, uh, plenary to close the day. Of course, we are all uh, missing to be uh, together in Oslo. But uh, let's take uh, the opportunity to reach more people thanks to digital. So I was asked to come and speak about uh, uh, how to strengthen surveillance and uh, COVID-19 and beyond. But actually, I want really to highlight that the partnership has started before COVID-19. And I want to share with you how we decided to collaborate uh, to strengthen integrated national surveillance information system. And of course, at the end, we can open it and see how beyond COVID-19, we can um, scale up and sustain uh, that effort together. So quickly, I will present to you uh, about the DHIS2 and um, immunization. And we, we have that uh, Gavi uh, partnership with the University of Oslo and of course with WHO and uh, UNICEF for some other aspect. Rapidly, um, Gavi um, is uh, uh, in support of DHIS2, and um, I just wanted to remind that Gavi is signatory uh, to the principle of donor alignment for digital health. Um, you can see the whole list of activities we are, we are doing. I just wanted to acknowledge that Gavi and all the alliance partners, including UNICEF, WHO, and CDC, we are all a soft software platform provider agnostic. However, we have to acknowledge the adoption of DHIS2 in over uh, six, more than 60 uh, countries. And we have also to acknowledge the leadership of University of Oslo and all the ISP network in providing guidance and technical support to countries. So it's how we engage uh, further with that specific uh, application and, and those partner. You can see uh, Gavi has started to engage with um, um, uh, DHIS2 and University of Oslo via the partners from 2016, the WHO and UNICEF, and then directly uh, with a direct partnership 
since three years started in 2018 and this was really following the, the demand from the country. We have a wide range of activities to support. Uh, DHIS2 can really uh, be of help in a lot of area. We have been talking about aggregate data for immunization, the campaign, the, the how to really work now also on the individual tracker for electronic immunization registry. We have a lot of work to do on interoperability and on GIS space, on uh, link with um, LMIS. But today we'll be focusing on the surveillance data. And really, uh, I, I will never emphasize enough how uh, surveillance data is really a life-saving intervention. And actually, the vaccine preventable disease surveillance information system is really essential. So of course, and really uh, saving life start by uh, preventing outbreak and improving the detection and the response against outbreak. But also uh, in another area that is very important for us is that the information from the surveillance um, help us to identify areas with immunity gap uh, by using triangulation and we can then target area with the highest number of what we call the zero dose children, the children who never been vaccinated in routine immunization. So when as data is also very important for us to understand the disease burden and therefore understand how uh, what is the level of coverage of vaccination, so the efficiency of the immunization program. And of course, we are all waiting the moment when COVID-19 will become a vaccine preventable disease, hopefully very, very soon now. And as soon as uh, COVID-19 will be a VPD, uh, we'll have to all work together for the introduction of that COVID vaccine, the COVAX, and then a VPD surveillance system will be uh, critical. So, what is happening with DHIS2 uh, as a platform for surveillance data? So I'm presenting really, you know, uh, we supported the project, but all the work was done by uh, WHO, and I want to acknowledge Alain, uh, Olivier Ranvo and um, Katia, and also by all the team in uh, Oslo and um, in ISP, especially ISP, West and Central Africa. So you may know that um, the, the VPD, uh, the Vaccine Preventable Disease Surveillance um, Investment Case for Africa have six major components. And one of this is really the information system. It's an ambitious work to be doing. So why uh, we decided to support the work on uh, DHIS2? And we actually just listened what the country and the partner were, were saying. And we heard it very loud and clear. We understood that AP Info uh, was no longer to be supported. And this will be really, really a huge uh, problem for the countries if there was no other solution to come up. There was more, at the time, there was already more than 40 countries in the WHO Afro regions that were already using the HIS2. And there actually, a lot of countries had already installed the WHO DHIS2 package for immunization coverage and DHIS2 started to be used by uh, in surveillance and immunization program for surveillance. And also the country and the partner were really asking a uh, web system uh, to have real-time data. So uh, the proposal came to really have an integrated information system for VPD and uh, all the epidemic prone disease surveillance in the HIS2. So the scope is at both level, at the global level, to really work uh, to have an information system design and to have all the DHIS2 development. And then there is a specific work on Africa for now to have to follow up and support implementation at country and at regional level. The feature is to really uh, try to replace uh, the existing Excel tool for IDSA and uh, several uh, countries talk about it, and also all the EP info work uh, for reporting system. And we wanted also to have this link to the regional platform and to have a kind of DHIS2 for VPD at the regional level and to have a country focus. To have systems that are really adaptable to country surveillance specificities for country can still choose the indicators, the disease, and that system should be interoperable with all the other existing systems in the country. So 
it was quite ambitious to start. Uh, we are not just supporting two or three diseases, but you can see more than 15 uh, different diseases and all of this, you know, with a specific partners, a specific entities, a specific modalities. So um, it's uh, quite uh, ambitious. Uh, so the package, WHO DHIS to package for sur integrated uh, surveillance came with that uh, default list that is in front of you for both aggregate and case base. But of course, uh, you know, any other disease can be added based on the national recommendation for each country for both aggregate and uh, case based surveillance. So, because it was a lot of disease, a lot of people to coordinate, and uh, Rebecca mentioned it, um, there was this uh, high level support that was really needed to, to, to solve several issues and kick off that work. And there was this big consensus meeting with a lot of people from a lot of different sections in WHO and, and um, from HQ, from Afro level, a lot of partners, CDC, ESP were all uh, represented. And uh, the objective was really to develop several package, uh, I mean, a package with several documents to really work on the data element documents with all the standards and norms very clear for everyone to work on the dashboard, could be disease specific, to also present alert, the epidemic, to all together agree on the system requirement and specificity. And of course, all of this will not be useful if we don't use the data. If so, it was also important to come up with a facility analysis guidance document and I want to acknowledge CDC, uh, especially on that piece of work. So the regional work was really important and you can look at the diagram. Uh, it was also mentioned by um, Alain uh, a bit earlier. So there is a WHO piece, but there is also um, a collaboration with WOW ECOWAS um, on the, um, uh, in Africa. They had already a functional DHIS2 platform for aggregate disease surveillance and an existing collaboration. So there is a, a way forward to make sure that the aggregate package is in all the WOW countries and that the database uh, from both WOW and AFRO will be uh, speaking together. Uh, just a quick update when where it is now. So um, Mali and uh, Togo and Rwanda have um, started to work on this, uh, and uh, Cameroon is about to to uh, to start. Uh, some other countries have uh, uh, shown already their interest, and the uh, interest can still be expressed, of course. And um, no pressure, but by May 2021, so in a couple of months, and in the middle of the pandemic, uh, we will say that this project will have been a success if you know the DHS2 surveillance package for both will be operation, operational. And if the surveillance data are really um, you know collected, reported to the DHS2 platform and used. So we are targeting uh, 20 uh, Afro countries uh, and for the aggregate package and at least three Afro countries for the entire case based uh, project. And then uh, we'll have to make sure all integration is considered that, uh, and also all the region and partner are kept informed and we have a plan for further implementation. After that initial planning, now we are going to talk about uh, scaling and sustaining this for, for all the country. I mentioned some of the challenges, of course, coordination is really talking about um, many I mean, so many different uh, uni division organization. Uh, so it could be a challenge, but it's also a great opportunity to, to learn how to work better. And then we have um, a lot of uh, staff distortion with the COVID-19 response. Not easy to implement, to support country, uh, to work at distance, and um, also for, for the communication between developers and, and all the technician. I want to highlight the fact that there is, especially due to the pandemic, a lot of funding diversion, multiplication of tools, and sometimes I think the interest of the country is a bit lost in all of this. And we will see the coming step for that project, a lot of dissemination, training, and making these resources available to the country. So just to finish, uh, yes, it started before COVID-19, and now um, I can just tell you how the pandemic had just like given a strong sense that the work we started before was extremely relevant, really, really important. And honestly, no one wanted another pandemic, but if another happened, but already all the surveillance information system are strong 
and if many countries are using such system uh, like we have seen on the HIS2 with the WHO package, we will be way more ready for the next pandemic. So thank you again very much for all the partners. You see the contacts and all the people who should be uh, acknowledged for, for that work and all the team behind that work. And I'm happy to hand over to you, Knut. Thank you so much, Karin. That's an excellent overview of uh, the work that Gavi has been doing as, as well as uh, the key partner from WHO. And uh, I must say, um, as, as the University of Oslo, we were also very grateful to the flexibility that, that the key partners like Gavi and also Global Fund have, have shown in this, this, this very uh, turbulent period. And I think together this, this partnership has, has, has shown uh, its value in, in this period and hopefully very much beyond. So please, Michelle uh, Monroe from Global Fund, uh, Please share your screen and uh, present. Okay. Let me switch to sharing my screen. Hello, everybody. Okay. Let's try to get the presentation. Can you see it well enough if I do it this way? Because I always have issues with presentation mode. Yeah, I think that's also fine, uh, Michelle. Let's get rid of that. Okay. So um, it's great to follow um, Corinne and Gavi uh, because uh, we have um, a lot of um, similarities and, um, and ways that we've been coordinating with each other. So a lot of the information that uh, Corinne has just shared on um, the um, support and the standards and the packages that are used for the vaccine preventable diseases it's been a very similar um, approach on um, HIV, TB, and malaria, um, and in fact with both DHS2 and WHO across um, uh, more uh, multiple disease and, uh, and programs. So um, I'm going to skip uh, some of the pieces that Corinne has already gone through about the kind of development of these packages and this, this pieces of the support. Um, but um, but know that those pieces have been have been going on um, for for each of these modules as well. Um, but I also want to introduce um, some of the areas that we've been supporting, and then how that's um, also um, had um, recent um, results impact, and then also um, how um, that has uh, strengthened the response um, to COVID nineteen. So um, for the first. Uh, slide you'll see it's actually quite similar to to Karen's as well um, and uh, we coordinate between um, Gavi and Global Fund and the other partners working in these different um, areas but um, using um, the same uh, packages and systems so for the Global Fund um, we have um, investments in DHS to base systems in um, of our 50, um, 53 um, highest um, burden uh, countries. Um, 41 of those plus a few others that are also um, piloting and rolling out now, um, there's three more, um, are using DHS2 based systems, um, at least for their national aggregate HMIS, if not also as well for um, using tracker for um, case space um, surveillance for HIV, TB, or malaria elimination. 
Um, so um, this um, is um, mostly funded through uh, the Global Fund grant investments to the specific countries, um, and that's maintaining and strengthening the quality of the DHS2 based HMIS. Um, and then now in this next, um, we're entering um, into our next three year cycle. Um, and we're seeing um, uh, so far a large increase um, in the country's funding as well, um, more uh, national scale community health information systems um, and linking those to the um, DHS to HMIS. Um, and then also um, for um, case-based reporting for um, HIV, TB, and malaria for elimination settings. Um, and, you know, it's a, we can't say for sure yet at this point, but a rough estimate, you know, is about 65% of those are, are um, DHS2 tracker-based, um, those requests so far for funding. So similar to Gabi, it's a, this is a, a for us, the, the countries are using DHS2 based system. We are also um, system agnostic, um, but essentially we're able, when we support um, these, um, these um, improvements to um, essentially, and also to the packages um, and the country um, investments, we're able to um, support many countries um, efficiently um, at once. So we have some uh, much smaller but central investments, um, uh, not through the grants. And that's really about increasing the efficiency so that each country and each grant does not have to invest in, in some of the core cross-cutting work um, in uh, DHS2 systems. Um, also, um, exactly what Corinne was talking about in this um, development with WHO, um, of the and the implementation um, of uh, the data analysis and use toolkit and the accompanying um, packages um, that Corinne showed very well for um, for EPI and the vaccine preventable diseases that we have for um, HIV, TB, malaria, and other disease programs. It's also a good segue, I think, for tomorrow because that's one of the big um, focuses for tomorrow's sessions. Um, and really um, trying to also increase um, local and um, regional and country level um, availability and, um, and also the coordination of technical assistance and other support for strengthening countries' national HMIS um, uh, and, um, and, and getting to our own strategic goals and targets around that. So next slide is just to show a few um, results from this um, most recently. Um, I will say these results um, are on this chart here are pre-COVID, they're from um, in 2019. We expect things will um, have dropped um, for this year, but um, we expect actually that will be temporary. Um, so what we've seen um, through supporting, and this is not only DHS two-based systems here, but um, as we said about um, uh, 75 percent of these um, systems are DHS2 based that are um, included in these results shown here. Um, so we have seen um, actually a pretty significant increase um, in the one, the integration um, of, especially for aggregate reporting um, of the three diseases um, into the national HMIS. So that's moving away from having siloed um, TB system and a siloed HIV system and a siloed malaria system and um, into one national HMIS, which of course creates a lot of um, efficiencies. Um, then the quality piece of that, um, making sure that when it's integrated, that there is still the needs um, addressed um, for each of those diseases monitoring in the national HMIS that um, the standards that are in these um, WHO and DHS2 packages um, really helps to ensure that. Um, also, I think really important to see is that there has been an increase um, that we see at a global reporting from HIV, TB, and malaria um, in, in um, completeness of um, reports, um, uh, you know, the percentage of facility reports, and especially in timeliness. It's still low timeliness uh, averaging across the three diseases across our in one year, an increase from 47 to 63%, um, which um, is very exciting to, to see, um, especially as people start looking at this concept of um, having available um, to make decisions um, even uh, faster than before. Um, and then, of course, um, looking into, um, into how this um, has supported for COVID-19. So my last slide here, 
um, what I want to highlight um, that we have found um, one um, having this existing partnership um, with um, uh, DHS2 with WHO and other partners um, facilitated a rapid response just um, in a way that we could um, uh, move funding quickly but also um, this piece about having um, these standard and um, established systems um, in place that could be adapted rapidly um, to um, add surveillance for um, COVID-19. And one of the um, items around that that, um, that um, has come up is that because these um, packages were um, for the diseases um, were already installed um, in so many countries. Um, one, um, when these packages, same similar, um, the similar model was used for COVID-19 for uh, that DHS2 um, uh, and the network has used um, to to create those um, you know packages that can then be quickly um, added into the country's HMIS. And so, um, so we see that having um, had that model there and then also countries having had the experience of um, installing those packages and adjusting, um, you know, adapting their system to them um, enabled um, them to very rapidly um, uh, develop the system um, essentially and to implement it in countries, um, of course, with um, a lot of um, different partner support, um, including Global Fund, um, but several others as well. And then we were also, um, again, it provides an efficient way for us, you know, we can put some um, uh, fairly minimal funding um, at a at global level um, to um, strengthen um, the COVID-19 surveillance and also the virtual means of disseminating and training um, folks and um, to have that have an effect um, across um, many of um, our um, uh, high priority countries. Um, and then a very important part of this is that um, in addition to having the increased COVID-19 um, surveillance and, and ability to, to react to those data um, for the pandemic is really, um, you know, trying to ensure that um, the HIV, TB, and malaria reporting, um, as well as services, but, um, but the reporting um, is still strengthened. And for us to be able to have um, countries adapt their existing um, systems, and in this case, for many countries, DHS2 systems that they're using for HIV, TB, and malaria reporting, to adapt that to COVID-19, it really um, makes it easier to, to keep up that HIV, TB, and malaria reporting, um, not adding parallel systems and parallel training, um, and, um, and the inefficiencies that would cause there actually strengthens um, the, um, the disease reporting as well. Um, the last thing I'd want to um, highlight is that it also has, um, and I think there was, you know, there was a, I think there, no, there was a session on this already today, um, is that having um, this in place has helped um, countries to, um, to monitor the impact uh, on the disease programs um, of COVID-19. And we are starting to pilot here as well uh, ways that we can take advantage of um, so many um, uh, countries using standardized systems and the standardized packages um, to make it easier for them to report uh, to us, to Global Fund directly um, from their systems. And so we're starting to pilot um, activities on that, especially as we're asking countries to, to give us um, uh, indications more frequently um, what's happening to the um, program services. And so um, this is a new area as well um, that uh, um, we um, will see expanding um, uh, as we move um, forward um, monitoring COVID-19. So those are the key things I wanted to highlight and uh, I'll hand it back to you. Knut. Thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, I really like your emphasis on, uh, on the importance of having, having systems in place, but not just systems, it's the whole approach and procedures that uh, teams on the ground are familiar with, and that has really helped, I think, with the COVID rollout. Um, and I also, uh, I also like what you mentioned about, you know, monitoring, the, your last point about facilitating the monitoring 
of the impact on the other diseases or the health system overall. We saw that with Ebola, actually, that in Liberia, they were still able to continue reporting. We could see the impact. And we very much hope that, uh, that the established HMIS systems out there uh, will, will allow us to really do the same with the, with the code. So uh, last, we hand over to Carl Kincaid. Uh, very happy to have CDC also present uh, on uh, the collaboration. Please, Carl. Hi, thank you. Let me pull my screen up. All right, can you see it okay? Yes. So hi everyone, it's, I'm happy to be here and, and uh, it's been interesting, you know, throughout this response, I've been wearing two hats. You know, one, I'm currently on the CDC COVID-19 uh, um, International Task Force where I'm on the surveillance and information system team looking at, at uh, surveillance activities across the globe. And on my, my day job, I've been, I'm on the surveillance and information system team in the Division of Global Health Protection, which of course is focused on, on the global health security agenda and how we support countries for IDSR and EIDSR and the like. And so um, as I see these activities occurring, I see the overlap of both my, my response uh, responsibilities and my day job and, and see the, the benefit of what, if any benefit is gonna come out of COVID, uh, it will be that we'll have uh, strengthened our systems and I'm hoping that we can leverage those activities. And so what does it, you know, what does that mean? And I think that um, we all talk about surveillance in different ways, you know, and, and we talk about sustainability, um, but what does that mean? And, um, you know, we need to create sustainable systems and, you know, we again, throw that word around, but at the end of the day, uh, we should be working toward, as in donors and implementing partners, um, we should be working toward working ourselves out of a job in a country. And so what that means that, that, you know, ministries of health will have the capacity to implement and maintain their systems. It, it's theirs. It's not ours. And we're donors, we're implementing partners, et cetera, supporting countries uh, to do their jobs and, and take care of their population. And our jobs is to, to work ourselves out of a job. And so how do we support countries and how do countries support their, their population by creating a sustainable capacity to detect diseases? And you can read the rest, I'm not gonna read it to you, but the point is how do we do our day jobs well enough as a public health community to then respond to things? So, you know, COVID-19 is right now. Uh, Ebola was, you know, a few years ago and currently in DRC. Uh, things will continue to pop up and so uh, we shouldn't just build systems to support the current um, thing, whatever that is. We support systems to help day-to-day -day work that, ena that enable the, the saving of lives in each country. That's our goal. And help uh, our decision makers make good decisions. And so uh, that's, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, we're also uh, helping countries to meet their international health regulation you know, disease detection and reporting. So we all sort of know that. And, and those countries that are part of the joint external evaluation see their scores and where they're at and what they need to do. Uh, and for us, from a global health security agenda perspective, uh, hope to support countries to meet those, you know, those, those top scores, you know, to be a four or a five, you know, five being for surveillance that you're supporting, you've already done it in your country, and now you're supporting countries around you. And so uh, that move to you know, real-time and near real-time case-based surveillance with lab integration, I think is critical. So, you know, so what do we do? Uh, how do we get there? First off, we've got to you know, respond and, and deal with the current outbreak of COVID-19. And uh, most countries at this point have you know, something in place. And then how do we take that investment and move it on? And, uh, this whole idea of COVID and beyond means how do we leverage um, this current investment into people and systems and, and improve uh, the next time and improve the day-to-day -day work. How do, we, how do we ensure that this work is interoperable uh, or integrated? You know, one of the challenges we always have are, are lab results. Um, you know, I was in Liberia for Ebola and then, of course, post-Ebola uh, for many years. And 
uh, one of the challenges during the, res the Ebola response was that integration of, of lab results into um, you know, the suspect data, case data. And then post Ebola, when you look at the IDSR, you know, for Liberia, they've been, you know, have been brought up a few times during this, during this uh, conference so far. They wanted to continue their case-based surveillance for their IDSR, and it's still been Excel-based. And so, so here you have the, the surveillance system collecting data on case-based data, and you have a lab system reporting case-based lab results, and then they have to match those up. Sometimes they match well, sometimes they don't. If you have a few cases, that's okay. If you have thousands of cases, it's not manageable. And so as you look at the current, uh, the current pandemic, we know these, this data in many countries isn't manageable to sit there and manually match data. So how do we fix that? And how do we work across and coordinate with partners and, and systems to make sure that the, the lab results, for one, are going in you know, automatically? But bigger than that, how do we work with other parts of the health information system? You know, how do we make sure that we know stock out? How do we make sure that we have workforce, you know, proper workforce and we're protecting them? And then how do we have collaboration across investors? You know, to me, this is, this is critical. Um, my time in Liberia taught me that I need to work closely with Global Fund. I need to work closely with USAID. I need to work closely with the WHO. We all need to be in those conversations together on how these structures uh, are, are, are supported. You know, countries oftentimes uh, are, are putting out fires and they're sort of responding to one donor and responding to another donor, responding to this need and that need. And, and oftentimes, you know, they're burdened by reporting that's done for reporting sake because the donor needs a report. And then that, that document goes on a shelf. So that document ideally would be used to improve the health system, not just to, not just to meet the need of the donor. And so how do we take those processes and then work with countries and ministries of health and improving their health systems? They don't need us. That's the goal. And how do we have a common vision of what surveillance is? You know, right now we have HMIS, which oftentimes sits, of course, in the Ministry of, in the ministry of Health and the M&E unit. But then IDSR may be in a different organization. So IDSR may be in the MPI. So in Liberia's instance, it's an infill, the National, Center, National Public Health Institute of Liberia. And then the M&E aggregate data is collected through the Ministry of Health. And so those ideally are together. It's not you know, to the end users and the end, end recipient of the workload, which is at the health facility level, it shouldn't matter to them. They should only need to understand that they have something they need to report on certain timelines. And whether it goes into an IDSR or HMIS or some other system and to the MOH or to the NPI or wherever it goes, uh, that shouldn't matter. It should just be how do we make the, the people at the, the bottom end who do the work, how do we make it easier for them to do reporting and then leverage those results across groups. And then of course, we need to leverage standards and past investments. You know, oftentimes people want to build their own stuff or build new systems because it's bigger or better or whatever. Uh, but when you put systems into countries, uh, it's not just technology, it's processes, it's people training, it's all these things that go into the structure and setup that, that ultimately make up the system. And that investment is large in human time and uh, that's hard to replace. So in leveraging those investments, leveraging partnerships, le leveraging collaboration are critical to get to a sustainable component of, of surveillance. So what is CDC trying to do to, to sort of help this? You know, one is we of course work with partners and work with different software vendors and, 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 and universities and the like um, through funding mechanisms. One of our funding mechanisms is a cooperative agreement. You know, people have been recipients of grants where basically money is just given to, to someone to do line item activities. A cooperative agreement isn't that. A cooperative agreement is a funding source that CDC pushes out to our partners. We have many cooperative agreements between ministries of health and CDC and WHO and CDC. And, but now we have a new one, which we haven't had in the past, which is with the University of Oslo. It's a five-year cooperative agreement. Uh, in this, uh, the idea is that, that CDC and the University of Oslo work together on, on these outcomes that will support uh, the globe. You know, the nice part about this investment and others have said it before me is that uh, by investing in University of Oslo, uh, it's the most bang for the buck, so to speak. I would invest in one place and it gets pushed out globally. So now we're helping Asia and we're helping Africa and we're helping Central and South America. We're helping EMRO. And so all these things are, are, 
uh, these investments get pushed out globally in sort of a one point of investment. But it doesn't mean that we're forgetting what the, the HISPs are doing and what the country work is doing, because there's also funding going to HISPs and there also is activities directly with countries. And so it's this three prong approach of how do we support the University of Oslo to develop what you see on the screen. And, uh, and then also HISPs to, to assist countries and then countries to, to do their, their immediate and needs uh, based on, on their specific activities. You know, so what are the big, the highlights in our, our cooperative agreement work? You know, one of course is to continue the, the uh, work around the COVID package and extend that work. Uh, number two is to look at interoperability, especially with lab. I think that's the biggest thing that we have to address is how do we sort of standardize that process of lab integration and surveillance. And then this move toward regional surveillance. And I'll talk more about that coming up. Um, but in addition to that, you know, this, the other components of this, you know, are, you know, how do we <clears throat> continue to build on their system of, of educational uh, tools. And at the end of the day, it, <clears throat> excuse me, at the end of the day, uh, Ministry of Health staff will be the ones who will own this system and they should have people trained. And, uh, and the more they're trained, the more successful they'll be. So CDC has been involved with University of Oslo through many different mechanisms and other partners, you know, one through in PEPFAR through DATUM and then with Gavi and WHO uh, with the VPD work, which we just talked, we just, just heard about. Uh, that work is incredibly important because as we look at how, how that system is used across countries and how can CDC and other partners team up with them to expand that work or to extend that work to stuff like EIDSR. Uh, how do we work with USAID and Global Fund and others on HMIS? You know, oftentimes the, the PMI work is sort of you're getting the output of that system and CDC may or may not always be in conversations around HMIS. Uh, but it's important that we're all talking together. It's one, it should be one surveillance structure of HMIS in case they say that. How do we collaborate across HISPs and, and countries to support IDSR and EIDSR? Again, if you look at Liberia's example of IDSR, they went, because during Ebola they were doing case-based surveillance, they stayed with case-based surveillance for all their IDSR, but in Excel spreadsheets. And so on their IDSR side, they were doing case-based surveillance via, via Excel, which means emailing Excel spreadsheets and merging them. And then every week, there's a team of people, and believe me, I've sat in this room, I know how painful this is, uh, sitting in the room, going through and merging spreadsheets from across all their counties or 15 counties into one spreadsheet to represent the nation and then make their weekly epi bulletin. You know, that, that staff shouldn't spend, you know, two and three days of their week making epi, epi bulletins. That staff should be helping implement what those bulletins represent. And that's where we've got to get to. How do we spend less time reporting and more time doing the public health work? And so, and that, that falls in then to, to why EIDSR is so important. How do we build structures so that that reporting can do the work, the reporting the system can do the work and the people can implement what the system is telling us. And from EIDSR perspective, in Liberia's example, they went to a case-based EIDSR, it's rolled out in five counties, it's, it's real time from the health facility, health, excuse me, I can talk, the health facility level where they send an SMS and it triggers the system. Immediately an alert goes to the, the health facility and, and triggers the whole system of response. And that work came out of Ebola. And that early Ebola work, uh, you know, I was in Liberia and we, we were, you know, at the info was being used early on. We've seen it was not necessarily doing what we had hoped it would do uh, for the country. And, uh, and then of course the Ministry of Health and us and, other, us and others worked with uh, University of Oslo to start using DHS2 tracker for the Ebola data and response. So on the right is sort of that picture of, of what many of you have seen Luke Bowell represent, you know, show in many, conference, in many conferences. Uh, but the idea is that how do we, you know, move these forward? How do we have integrated systems? We need both aggregate and case-based data. We need to have lab results integrated. We need to, to have this, this, this information timely so that, so that leadership can respond. And we need to understand the rest of the picture. We can't just understand that we have a disease in this place, and yes, it was confirmed, but then not know if you have meds to respond with it. You need to know stock. You need to know workforce. Do we have qualified people? Do we have stock? Do we have the ability, you know, like finances? You know, I know a lot of us, it's like, oh, well, it's finance systems, you know, but they're important, of course. You know, nothing, nothing happens without money. And so all these have to be integrated into, into a response. And oftentimes, from a CDC perspective, we're not always in those other conversations. 
you know, that's usually Carl? paid for by other organizations. Sorry, Carl, uh, two minutes. Okay, thank you. And so, um, and so we need to look at how we integrate across health information systems. And then the way you do that right now is leveraging this re response. Right now, a lot of countries have implemented the COVID package. And so how do we take that investment and then move it toward the rest of their prior diseases post COVID or right now? They should already be on their timeline. They should already be thinking, we're doing this for COVID. How do we do this for the rest of our prior diseases? And then once you think about how you respond from the perspective of, all right, we're doing this now, we're doing it for COVID, we're integrating lab, it's one disease, now let's move it to the all the prior diseases. And then how do we move this to regional and global? And this is important because, you know, we have to look across countries. When you look at donors and, and implementing partners and the like, uh, you know, WHO and CDC and USAID and Global Fund and World Bank, they're all looking at where is the need? You know, unfortunately, money is not unlimited. And so they have to decide where they're going to invest and where, who needs the money the most and where is the problem the most. And this is where all this, this helps make those decisions. Leaders need to have information uh, to understand how to invest their funding. All right, thank you. That was kind of a quick tail end of it. The important part is that, that uh, we understand the importance of both the current surveillance work that's been done through the University of Oslo and the HISP and the countries to support the COVID response. But we also have to have to think about what comes next. You know, what's, what's the system like for the next outbreak? We shouldn't be building systems during outbreaks. The system should be there. And so how do we move toward planning these systems to support day-to-day -day work that then also support a response? Oftentimes we're saying, I wanna build a system for response. Well, in my mind, we're not, we shouldn't be building systems for response. We should be building systems to support day-to-day -day work to relieve the burden as much as possible on the people at the end of the, at the, end of the, the road, uh, either from the collect data collection side of it or the people sitting in the national level trying to put that data together into some usable form to inform leadership. The day-to-day -day work should inform a response. To you, Canute. Thank you so much. That's an excellent way to end this um, session, uh, Carl. Uh, thank you so much to you and to Michelle and Karine. And I'm just going to hand it over to, to uh, Rebecca to wrap up the whole day on the COVID and packages. Thanks. Thanks, Knut. And thank you so much, um, Carl and Karin and Michelle. I know you guys have very busy days, um, as many of our presenters have as well. Many of those who are focused on countries and really focused on supporting the response. So we wanted to thank you so much for taking time out of your schedules to, to learn and share with our global community. And we have so much great work to, to look forward to together um, with the support of great partners that want to help countries be able to achieve their own goals and, and also align ourselves at a global level. So we will wrap up the day today. Um, we continue to encourage you to look up sessions you might have missed on our YouTube channel. Um, keep our conversations going on the community of practice thread. There was a lot of learning and asking of questions where I think there are many use cases around our community that we couldn't cover today. And um, just give you a little bit of a heads up that tomorrow morning, um, the WHO will open off our conference with the plenary session to share a little bit more about this um, collaboration around data standards that, that has been running through as a theme today um, as one of the ways that we're really able to, to strengthen these routine health systems to make sure, as, as Carl reminds us, that they're actually getting used. It's not just a reporting tool.